This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today we're starting part one of a two-episode edition of Viewpoint. We have an exclusive interview with a man who served his country and then served time in prison. Nick Slatton was working with Blackwater Security Consulting in 2007 when they were trying to secure U.S. officials in a place called Nisser Square. You may have heard some of the story in the media, but today we want Nick to share his side. That includes his conviction, sentencing to life in prison, and also his miraculous release. Despite the injustice, Nick says the time he spent in prison was when God showed him his greatest love and mercy. How old were you when you, when you first enlisted in the Army? I was 18. 18 years old. How many, how many tours in Iraq? I had two tours with the 82nd Airborne. Uh -huh. And when you came back, uh, what, what made you want to start looking around again for something like, uh, like a military contractor? Well, at first it was either advance into division alerts or go to the special forces. They were right across the road from us. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I already became a sniper and a fire team leader. And so it was either time to go special operations route or to get out of the military. And uh, I went to a job fair mm -hmm. and at the job fair, they were like, you're, they wanted to know my qualifications and they're like, we need snipers. And they told me that basically I would be on a rescue team uh, going after diplomats when they were in trouble, basically who would extract whenever they got shot at or any danger, we would go get them. Yeah. So, so at that point in time, were you, uh, was was Christ in your life at all? Were you praying about these decisions? You know, I got saved when I was eight years old, mm -hmm. so I had the understanding of eight year old. You know, I believe yeah. that Jesus honored that, but I believe as I grew up, I just uh, did what I wanted to do, yeah. and I never asked God, you know what do you want me to do with the life you've given me? And so, you know, he's merciful. He protected me through all of that and uh, brought me, you know, brought me out of the fire. Yeah. So he, uh, he can do anything. For sure. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to talk about some miracles here a little bit later on, but uh, why Blackwater? I mean, uh, there was a, at the time there were probably, I don't know, 150, 200 military contractors operating in Iraq because the draft was gone and, and not enough people were enlisting. So military contractors were doing the work that the military used to do. And so they were hiring contractors. Why did you go to go with Blackwater? They are the only independent contracting company that was involved in executive protection that never lost a principal. So Nick, when, when you got the, the uh, Blackwater training, I mean, did you feel like you were fully equipped to go back to, back to Baghdad, back to Iraq? I mean, the equipment at Blackwater was supposed to be better than what the military had. Did you feel like you were, you were ready to go? Yes, sir. The first part was all vetting. So basically you proved that you were a good shot. And then after that, they taught you personal security detail. So they taught you how to be a personal security Security specialist, which basically means that you are right there with whoever the principal is, and you're taking them to meetings or whatever. Just you are their bodyguard, so to speak, in layman's terms. Blackwater may have even told you that their life was more important than yours, and <laughs> you needed to take a bullet for them. They did. Yeah. They explained that these people are very important people and that they're worth more than you are, and they're worth more than everyone over here in the country of Iraq. So you do whatever you gotta do to get them home, and that's what we did. So when you got back to Baghdad, uh, President Bush was getting ready for the surge. He was gonna put 20,000 additional forces into, into Iraq, and Baghdad was the most dangerous city in the world with the surge. What's going on uh, with, the, with the Iraqis? I mean, you talked about tribalism there. What was going on right then? What made it so dangerous? We were right in the middle of a civil war, and then they added a lot of troops, a lot of American troops into the middle of that. So you've got all these foreign fighters who just want to kill Americans that are showing up. So it was just chaos in the streets. There was 180 firefights every single day um 
while I was there, the January 23rd incident happened, 2007, where we lost five of our brothers. We had to fight for three and a half hours to recover their bodies. We had to fight our way through five ambushes just to get to them. February happened shortly after that, Central Rail Station incident where we extracted a team in contact where the Iraqi army was shooting at our guys. So it was just this constant uh, tempo of not only people dressed in civilian clothing trying to kill us, but people dressed in Iraqi army, Iraqi police. You know, you never knew who to trust. And um, like I said, there were 5 million people in that city, and about 3 million of them wanted to kill you. So... It was just, um, yeah. there were only 19 of us out there at a time, so we had to rely on each other to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Well, that sets the stage then for what happened on September 16th, 2007. Uh, take us through that uh, as you guys were in the chow hall, and take us through what happened there in Nisser Square. So as soon as we sat down, there was a loud explosion, and we are calling on the radio that, there's a team in contact on venue that they are receiving fire and that also there's a vehicle born IED, which is basically a car bomb has been detonated. So we're running to the trucks and we get geared up and we start rolling out. And so we're expecting to have to go out and recover a vehicle that has been hit by a car bomb. So we're expecting to have to go again, recover, recover our brother's remains so we get orders when we're halfway to them that okay another team like ours 2-2 two -two has showed up and they have cross-loaded everybody everybody's okay and they've got them in their package and they're bringing them to our location so we had to lock down this circle and we basically blocked off traffic that was coming from the south to the north and we pushed traffic that was coming from the north to the south out of the circle. That way that they could just flow right into the green zone. And within a minute of being in that circle, we started receiving incoming fire, started receiving rounds onto the side of our vehicle. And then a um, firefight broke out and our vehicle was disabled. We had to be towed out of there. While all this is happening, um, the other team is still receiving fire that extracted the principal team. They have been advised by base to take a different location back, take a different route back to the green zone. So they basically turned around in the middle of the road, fought their way back through the ambush, and then uh, got her back safely to the green zone. Mm -hmm. And so after about five minutes, we got ourselves hooked up and towed out and made it back without further incident. And that seemed like a, a, a standard, I should say, standard gunfight in Baghdad at that time, right? It was you guys saw it that was, you guys saw that stuff every day. It was one of the shortest duration gun battles I had ever been in okay. since I had been there. So yes, it wasn't very significant at all to us. Yeah, and it's, at that time there was uh, simultaneously there was three gun battles going on around Baghdad at the same time. Uh, so bodies or, or wounded coming into the hospital were coming from all three of those gunfights, right? Yes, sir. So ours and Raven 2-2s at the same time. And then 30 minutes prior to that, there was an Army team further to the mm -hmm. south that had got in, I think, like a 15-minute gun battle. So there was a lot of shooting going on in a short, short amount of time in just one little district. So you were the you were you had four vehicles and you were lined up on one side of that uh, that big circle. Nisser Square is a huge traffic circle, so you were blocking traffic coming from one direction to clear a path for the 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 other team to come back and bring the principal back. Yes, sir. They as soon as they loaded up in vehicles, one of our sister teams mm -hmm. went out. Raven Two Two, I believe, was the name of that team, and they showed up at the venue first. They were able to get all the people in the motorcade and they started driving back towards our direction. They started receiving contact as they were leaving their venue. Now, con a, explain contact. When you talk about contact, tell, what, tell our audience that, what you're talking about. That means that somebody's shooting at you. It's a nice so, way to say you're getting shot at, right? That's right. So yeah. they're, they're getting shot at as they were leaving their venue. 
And so within, it depends on who you ask, within 30 seconds to two minutes of us pulling into that circle, we started receiving contact as well. Mm-hmm. Which meant Iraqis were engaging us with AK-47s. And so we advised the principal team that was coming to us to find another route back Mm -hmm. to the green zone so they took an alternate route back every morning before you guys left the uh, the compound before you left uh, the green zone you would get a a security briefing and part of that security briefing was a uh, be on the lookout for a bola report and they would they would tell you to be on the lookout for certain vehicles that they knew from uh from intelligence that had been uh, outfitted as car bombs that morning you'd received one that said be on the lookout for a white kia is that correct Yes. And that was the car that, I mean, that was what you thought was coming towards uh, your position. Uh, tell me about how, how, how you would normally handle something like that. That car had moved out from the traffic and was coming towards you. It, it had bumped out, that, uh, witnesses said that, and was coming towards your, your position. Yeah, like, I can't speak too much on the, that car because I could not see it. You couldn't see it, it. Until it had already been engaged. So machine gunners did their job. They did the best they could in a hard situation where you don't know if this guy is just not paying attention or if this guy is actually a car bomber, you yeah. know. So you have a split-second decision as a machine gunner, and the rules of engagement say that you can engage. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't tell you what, what they did and what sequence or anything. All I know is they did their job, right? and they did the best they could. Right. And, and, and we'll, we're going to point our audience towards some other information a, bit, a little bit later on because we're not going to be able to get to it all. But uh, from what I've read and, and what I've seen in, in transcripts and what I've, I've heard is that uh, it's very tragic. There was, a, there was a civilian, an unarmed civilian in that white Kia, he and his mother, and they had pulled out of traffic for some reason. I may be trying to get out of the square and started driving towards you guys and didn't stop. And that, that signals that it's that it's a threat to your to your convoy. So that's why that car was was neutralized, why those people were killed. That's the tragic thing is they were two innocent people that did get killed that day. But it wasn't something that w- would have happened had they had they stopped and stayed in the traffic. Uh, to prove that, that you guys were fired on and being fired on and being, having fire return is that uh, the vehicle, I don't know which, whether it was your vehicle or one of the lead vehicles, uh, the radiator was shot out of it and had to be towed out. Was that your Was that your vehicle? Yes, sir. I was in the vehicle, and uh, we started receiving impacts on the side. Um, two Iraqi cops opened fire on us, and basically they started shooting from the hip mm-hmm. and walked up. And when they did that, some of those rounds skipped up underneath the vehicle and hit the radiator. You guys got hooked up and got towed back to the green zone. What happened at that point? We were checking each other for holes, making sure that we hadn't, because a lot of times, you know, people get shot and realize it, like under their body armor, you know, in their mm-hmm. armpit or something, and they won't even know it. And so we, we were doing the whole, and the after action report, you know, what happened, uh, what we did good and what we could have done better, you know, that kind of thing. We'll return with more of Nick Slatton's incredible story of freedom after being accused of crimes he claims he didn't commit. Viewpoint is hitting more topics head-on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, but we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Placey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Placey. We now return to my interview with Nick Slatton, and stay tuned. 
We want to share more about others, just like Nick, who are awaiting freedom in American prisons after becoming political pawns. Well, when, when did this uh, kind of go off the rails a little bit where it wasn't quite the same as other engagements? Did you guys begin to realize that somehow the State Department uh, was doing things a little bit differently because of this yeah. one? 30 minutes probably after it took us to get our gear squared, they had a TV in there and CNN was already talking about it. And we were like, already, we were just already. So within 30 minutes, they were already doing reports on it. So, and they were reporting uh, huge body counts or what were they? They were just saying that civilians got hit up and, okay. and a, that's all they would say, you know, and, and the thing that, the thing that a lot of people forget about this incident is a car bomb detonates. We have to go expecting to pick up our buddy's body parts. You know, we expect when a car bomb detonates, we didn't have, we didn't realize that it had detonated outside the venue. Mm -hmm. We thought that their motorcade had got hit by the car bomb. And so when that happens, it usually kills people. And so when we went, we were expecting to have to recover our buddies again. And so you're dealing with that. You're dealing with they're getting shot at two two while they're on venue trying to get the lady out of the mm -hmm. venue that's under attack. And then we start getting shot at. Thirty minutes prior to that, there was an army team a little further south and they got into about a fifteen minute gun ba battle with Iraqi police. Was there anything different about what was going on with the State Department and their response to all the things happening in Nisser Square? The thing that I remember most is they made us go over that night and be interviewed individually, and that had never happened before. Mm -hmm. So usually, like, you would write, they had procedures, you know, you would write out what happened, but never had they pulled me into a room by myself and wanted to know what happened, you know. So it was, it, it felt more uh, formal, I guess you would call it. More like an interrogation than just a just a uh, conversation. It turned into one, mm -hmm. and that's when um, members of our team pointed at the map and was like, "Look, this is where we were getting shot at from. If you don't believe us, you go out there and look." And you'll find something that shows that we were getting shot at. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. You know, they went out there based on reports from members of Raven 2-3 where they were receiving enemy incoming fire from. And they found freshly expended AK-47 shell casing. So, I mean, the, the State Department was like case closed. They, case they closed. put us back on duty. You know, they were like. Whatever. Yeah, I think uh, President that was basically President Bush's reaction as well, wasn't it? These guys were doing their job and, and case closed. Well, President Bush, you know, he was very smart in the way that he didn't get into it politically. Mm -hmm. But what he said was, that's a State Department issue. But if you look at the law, they didn't have even jurisdiction to come after us because we were covered under diplomatic immunity because we were protecting diplomats mm -hmm. so that's what the president meant he just didn't come out and said it yeah. i wish he would have then none of this would happen <laughs> yeah. but but he was basically like i'm dod you need to go talk to dos right mm -hmm. well let's fast forward a little bit because i want to cover this uh when did you guys know that uh you kind of had become pawns in a in a big political chess game. There was some things going on in Iraq at the time. So from 2007 to 2009, it took them that long to indict you. People had found all of that brass in, uh, in Nisser Square. There was an investigation. There was some other information there that people can find online. But they were, the media was saying that you guys had massacred innocent civilians, unarmed civilians, yet we know that you were being fired upon and you, and they were, you were fired upon first. So you're indicted in 2009. Uh, what were you indicted for? I mean, there, there's, there, was there five of you at that time, counting Jeremy? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so actually, there would have been six of us. Okay. So, so one thing I want to say about that first indictment, we had a very fair judge, Judge Irby. Mm -hmm. his name. And he wanted, because he knew it was real political, obviously. So he wanted to see all the evidence, even the classified stuff, everything laid out before he even let them proceed. Looked at the evidence against me 
and basically asked the government to dismiss the case me first. And they said they admitted that they had weak evidence against me. And that was 14 counts of manslaughter and 24 counts of attempted manslaughter, I think was the charge at the time. So, with, Yeah, with no they, bodies, no bodies. And they didn't have enough evidence to indict me is what the judge ruled. So basically they paraded me all over television and front page of all kinds of newspapers calling me all these names of monster or whatever. And they didn't have any evidence that I did anything wrong. In fact, the evidence that they had completely exonerated me, but it was classified. So civilians couldn't see it. Yeah. So he, he basically threw the, threw the case out, right? He did. Judge Urbina. The government w was hiding things that mm -hmm. would have helped my brother's cases. There were several Brady violations. If you go back and read the transcripts, several of those. Now, after that, there's this big uproar, and, and apparently in Iraq, they, they wanted you guys prosecuted. They wanted you held. Uh, I don't know. They, they wanted you executed, probably. But uh, at the time, the vice president went to Iraq and pledged to them that they were going to, the United States government was going to put everything behind this to get you guys convicted. This is what I thought. So basically, when I saw Joe Biden standing next to Maliki, like, I knew. So give me the timeline now. You, this is starting in 2009. It's dismissed. And you guys suffered for the next, well, until now, really, until last Christmas, maybe, uh, a year ago. Uh, with the with the Department of Justice and their, they seem to they got very vindictive. What happened with the second trial? Uh, the second trial, they waited five years before they brought it back. They had to build a new case. Basically, they did. They did because of all the lies that were told. You know, everything was tainted, and so it started over. And had five years to re-indict me and they failed to do that they failed to indict me within the statute of limitation for the manslaughter charge. for manslaughter yes sir and so what did they do so they told me that if i could waive my constitutional rights to a statute of limitation or they were going to up the charge first degree murder now these are the same prosecutors that had told a judge back in 2009 that they didn't have enough evidence to proceed with manslaughter charges. But all it took was a different judge and pressure from higher ups. And then yeah. now the, all of a sudden they've got evidence. Yeah, the pressure at that time, if, if our audience wants to understand this, is that uh, ExxonMobil was negotiating new oil leases. There was an election coming up. And the SOFA agreements, the, 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 the status of, of, of the American Army and the American military being in Iraq was up to be re-signed. And the United States wanted to stay in Iraq to stabilize it. They wanted those oil leases uh, uh, rewritten. And uh, so they, they wanted to make this, I can't even remember his name now, Malachi, the prime minister at that time, made him look good so he'd get re-elected. And he wanted to be tough on the Americans. And so that's why... They're coming after you guys with, with all, all the power they had with the federal government. Is that correct? Is that a, a good synopsis? Yeah. That's, you got it. <laughs> so in 2009, that first trial with Judge Urbina is, is dismissed. He says there's not enough evidence. You can't prosecute these guys. And then it goes to another judge, Judge Lambreth. And he seems to be extremely vindictive about this whole thing. And he lets the prosecutors do whatever they want in the courtroom. And uh, tell me about those trials. You know, you're raised um, to believe that we have the best system on the planet. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I went and fought for all these constitutional protections, fought for other people's. And then just to see the way that they really run the system, doesn't matter if you're innocent they don't care they just want to plead guilty so that they can win you know mm -hmm. i think it's 97 percent conviction rate is what they have so if you go to trial you've got a three percent chance of winning wow now did they ever offer you a deal to flip on your brothers they did what was that what was that all about at the very beginning when they 
basically acknowledged that they didn't have any evidence against me. They said that they would basically just give me immunity and let me go to the grand jury and testify. So, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that. My lawyer at the time said, well, they can charge you with obstruction of justice for refusing an immunity order. And I was like, well, you just tell them that I'm going to refuse it. And he's like, well, they'll put you in jail. And I was like, well, how long? And they said a couple of years. And I was like, well, tell them I'll go to jail for a couple of years then. So I refused to help them in any way. It seems like uh, also they, they want to keep you in the, in the case to keep you from being able to testify on behalf of uh, Dustin and, and, and the others, your other brothers. Because if, if you're not in the case, the defense can call you as a witness and the case against those three guys would have been gone. Right. Yeah. So they've got to get you, and they change it from manslaughter because the the, the uh, statute of limitations has run out on the manslaughter uh, indictment. So now they charge you with murder one. Looking at these trials, I mean, there was just so much prosecutorial misconduct. I mean, even the uh, the the National Association of Defense Attorneys said that this this trial should have never never gone completely through the trial. The judge should have thrown it out. But eventually, this gets to the point where you guys are found guilty. The jury comes out, they read your your verdict first. What was that like? I had already come to peace with it. I knew that I knew they were going to find me guilty. So it was just, I was just numb. I was numb to you know. I had a lot of trouble when I came back from the war with uh, post-traumatic stress, still suffer from that. And, uh, you know, it was just, I just knew it was coming. Next week, we'll continue our discussion with Nick Slatton. Here's a preview of that interview. And then I hear, and I had never heard God speak to me before audibly. I'd heard him in my heart, you know, and I'd, I'd heard him, you know, in my head, but never an audible voice. So I think I'm going crazy. I hear Slatten, pack your stuff. You got a presidential pardon. So I'm like, yeah, I haven't had enough to eat, whatever. So they let us out like a few days after that. And I get on the phone, call my sister. And she said, Nick, have you talked to anyone? And I said, no. She said, well, the New York Times reported that President Trump is considering pardoning soldiers accused of war crimes. And it mentioned you by name. God gave you a timeout, and you accepted it as a timeout, and he changed your life. Oh, yeah, that's what any good father would do. If their son is acting up, you know, you're going to put him in timeout. Thank you for joining me for this edition of Viewpoint. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. If you are enjoying Viewpoint, we would appreciate your financial gift so we can continue to produce more programs.